I have my colleague Abhishek Anand with me. We both work for Aquia and our session is Scaling Drupal 8 and we believe that after attending our session you will get to know about it, lots of good techniques how to scale large scale websites and small scale websites uh, within the limited infrastructure. Hi guys. So the session topic is scaling Drupal 8. I'll talk about scaling and Naveen will talk about Drupal 8. Will that work? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So a brief introduction, both of us, we work at Acquia and uh, uh, we are currently working with the Lightning team and we're working with Lightning and we're doing some very good stuff there. So if you guys are interested, we are hiring. Come to our booth. So. Like I said, uh, we want uh, the topic is scaling Drupal 8, but I think it's essential for us to understand what scaling or what optimization is, and why is it important, and how. And I'll briefly cover uh, what are the general principles of optimization and uh, why should we do it. And then we will get into Drupal 8 specific things. What are new in Drupal 8, and we will see a small video in the end which will show some cool stuff that Drupal 8 has in terms of optimization. So what is website optimization? Website optimization is basically the process or things that you do to make your website load faster. But the question is why do you want your website to load faster? Is it important at all? What do you guys think? Is it important? Yes. How important is it? A little important or very important? And why is that? Traffic? I don't really care user experience. I don't really care about Google induction either. I care about money. I care about my sales. Do you think that is going to impact it by a slow website? Yes. Why? People will leave. That's right. So there are data to prove that. Amazon found that every 10 milliseconds of, sorry, 100 milliseconds of latency cost them 1% of their sales. And 1% of Amazon's sale is a big deal, right? And we are just talking about 100 milliseconds. And Google found that an extra five seconds in search feed generates a drop of traffic by 20%. Just imagine 20% of the traffic of Google Right? It's a big deal. And just 0.5 seconds. So now you might know how important it is to load your website in, in a very fast way. How fast should the website load? It should load sooner than you blink your eyes. Right? And we want to do that with Drupal. Do you think Drupal is a very fast? No? Why? Why do you think why do you think Drupal is not fast? So Drupal is not fast is a this question is very subjective. If I tell you Drupal is very fast in serving anonymous requests, is that true? Drupal is not so fast in serving authenticated requests. But can you tell me something which is very fast in serving authenticated requests? No, right? There's nothing which is really fast in serving authenticated requests because you need to build your page every single time. But for anonymous requests, you can do a lot of things. You can get away with a lot of things. We'll see all that. Let's see a little graph. The x-axis, the horizontal axis is your page load time in seconds. And the vertical axis is the percentage of people who abandon your site. So if your site loads in 4 seconds, you will have a traffic drop of 25%, which means 25% of people are not, are bouncing off from your site because your site loads in 4 seconds. It's a big deal, 25% of your traffic. When we talk about optimization, there are two, there are two major aspects of it. 
One is how much your server can scale or how much request your server your, or your application stack can deliver concurrently, right? And we generally focus there, right? My, I should have a farm of servers and it should be able to serve all the requests. But even if you do that, there's one aspect, your site can still be very slow. Imagine I had, you know, a lot of, lot of server, high scale server and, uh, and still my site is slow. Do you think that can happen? And why would that happen? Right. And why would network interfere in your site speed? Because the way you have made your application is not very optimal. There, there, there is a lot of things. Server has only a very small part to play in a request response cycle. It just delivers the page. 80% of time is spent on the network. The HTTP call that goes to the server and the response that comes back. 80% of the time is spent in the network and rest of the rest of a small percentage is, it's not a small percentage, but a big percentage in rendering or painting the page. Your browser also takes time to paint your page. And I'm not sure if you know this, how many of you like panels a lot? And how many of you hate panels? Like equal number of people hate panels and equal people like panels. Who hates panels? And why do you hate panels? And why is that? C tools has to do things on the server side. It has a nested nested divs. If you have, if if you guys would have attended modern DK session, he wants to take out every single div that he can. Why? What is the disadvantage of that? It takes a lot of time to paint your page, the render your page. The render time goes very high. <coughs> and that's, a, that's one thing which kills a lot of web pages. And, in, uh, and you'll find this problem with a lot of Drupal sites because people use panels heavily without even changing the DPLs. And at the end, their page, the server might be very fast, but the, at the end, the page does not appear to be very fast. Reason being, it takes a lot of time to paint the page. Also, they write JavaScript in a not so nice way, in a very blocking manner. And JavaScript is the biggest culprit in your page's paint time. We'll get into details of all that, but some basic stuff that everyone should do uh, in optimization. Optimization is like you need a very specialist, it's a specialist job to look at a website and tell what are the problems and uh, how to solve them. And the first thing that you need to do when you are optimizing a website is to find the bottleneck. Do not go around optimizing everything because every kind of optimization comes with a cost. Right? If you're adding a reverse proxy in front of your site, it, there's a maintenance overhead. If you're adding a load balancer or a replicate database, there's a maintenance overhead. So always know your requirement, find the bottleneck, and then solve the performance problem. But besides that, there are certain things that everyone should do. Not doing these things is a crime. And that's what I'm going to talk about. And then we'll talk about Drupal 8 and other stuff. So never, said, never send uncompressed content to the browser. Your browser can decompress contents, content in, in a jiffy, very little time. But it saves a lot of network bandwidth. And, uh, Apache has a mod deflate and uh, Nginx is very good at compressing your content. You can do that on the server level. You can also do that on uh, application level, level. Drupal does that. Advanced cache module does uh, Sorry, advanced aggregator module does that for you. But I would recommend do not do it on application level. Try to minimize the overhead of the application. Do it on the server level. And if you're using Nginx, Nginx has one more beautiful feature. Like every time it compresses a content, it saves a .gz extension in the same location. Next time, if you request the same content, it will try to find a .gz, a GZ extension. If it finds it, it will serve it. So it will not compress the content again and again. Combine, do not have too many CSS and JavaScripts 
always aggregate that. Drupal does this for you. You don't have to worry about this. But make sure uh, writing your code in such a way, do not add a lot of uh, conditional code in modules. What people generally do is hook in it and Drupal add JS on based on some condition. This is, that is not a good thing to do unless you really need to do it. Because more conditional JS that you add, there are more, uh, ag advanced aggregation will have to create more files based on pages. What it does is it creates a comp uh, an aggregation file based on a certain page. If you go to a different page on which this aggregation does not is not valid, you should have to create another another aggregation. So try not to uh, add conditional JavaScript unless you really need to do it. Best way to do it is to is to add in the info file. Um, make as less HTTP request as possible. This can be achieved in multiple ways, like the previous one, combining JS and CSS in, in a single file. Uh, try to use sprites. Sprites, uh, you, you guys know what is what is a sprite? You combine all your small images into one big image, and uh, then you it is you you save a lot of network request. Uh, maintaining sprites is a big overhead. So what you can do is there's a module in Drupal eight, Drupal called CSS3 embed. Uh, you can always embed your images into your CSS file using base64 encoding. Uh, if you do that, you don't have to maintain sprites. It is not supported in IE7 and lower browsers, but if you support IE7 and lower browsers, uh, then you will have to maintain sprite. There's no other way. So, and then always have JavaScript at the bottom never on the f on the top because javascript works in a blocking manner when a javascript uh, resource is requested it will block other contents from being uh, being delivered so uh, try to include javascript at the, at the bottom S using sprites avoid iframe i think we have already covered this always use a cdn how many of you know what is a dos attack what does dos means No. <laughs> That's something which my grandfather used to use. Not even him. <laughs> you are the grandfather of Drew. Like in terms of experience and knowledge. So, yeah, denial of service. And how many of you have faced real challenge with that? Right? And our, we are application developers right we do not, we are not server architecture architects like as a drupal developers as as aquia we are but so it is not your application's job to find out denial of services and block ips and do things like that right cdn like akamai or cloudflare will detect dos or ddos ddos is distributed denial of services it is smarter than dos because with dos attacks you can block the ip address and and you and that attack is gone. But DDoS is more uh, complicated. They have different packet patterns. They have different IP addresses. And everything is spoofed. So it is not easy to detect and, uh, and, and check. So these CDS, they have expertise in doing this. Plus your server, all your static resources will be served from the CDN. You don't have to worry about, the, about them. All you need to worry about is the only HTML request that comes to your page, which uh, which involves Drupal and other things. No static resources. Reduce DNS lookup. It is, uh, sorry, another point is always use cookie free domain. Not a lot of people do this. You have a, I have a domain called example.com. I serve my CSS, JS, and images from the same domain. But do you know what happens? What happens is every other request has cookies attached to it. What is the use of cookies in images? Can you tell me? Do you need cookies in images? No. Do you need cookies in, in CSS? And cookies, uh, HTTP is a, you know the format of HTTP, right? So it will increase the every, if you pass a cookie, and if you're using an application like Drupal, your cookie might become a, become a little big. So around 4 KB or 5 KB, you're wasting with every request. Instead of that, if I have example.com, 
I can create a domain like static.example.com and make that domain cookie free. All your static resources will go from static.example.com which will be cookie free and you will save at least 500 KB of data on every page request. Not 500 KB but 200 to 300 easily. So always use cookie free domain. Uh, reduce DNS lookups. Do not have a lot of domains to be looked up in your um, web page. Like, do not have third party domains. Like, I have example.com, some, some other website, facebook.com, google.com. If you have add more of domains, what happens is there has to be a DNS lookup and it takes time. So, the num more number of domains you add to your uh, web page, the more domain, uh, DNS lookup will be there and hence a slower page. Remove duplicate assets. I have seen a lot of uh, sites outside Drupal where jQuery is included twice. Some people want jQuery 1.8, some, someone wants jQuery 2, j, jQuery dot no conflict and add another jQuery. Do not do this. Do not add duplicate resources. Uh, use expires headers. I think everyone does that. We, we generally do not have to worry about it because Drupal takes care of all these things. But it's, it's good to know uh, to deal with expire headers. Expire headers and e-tags. These are very important <coughs> concepts to be aware of. Um, sorry, I have used CDN another time, but it's the same thing. Uh, always use a reverse proxy. Uh, I don't think I need to talk more about this because everyone know, knows what a reverse proxy is. And if you are... Uh, if your user base is 80% anonymous, you should always, or 70% anonymous, you should still use re reverse proxy. You should re use reverse proxy in, in any matter, even if you have 100% authenticated users. Reverse proxy will help you in a lot. For example, Warnish will save things in memory. And even if you're requesting a static resource, there has to be a file I.O., which is still expensive, more expensive than a memory lookup. So always use reverse proxy. Uh, Memcache has a a lot of utility in Drupal and outside Drupal world people also use Redis. Both are key value store. Redis is uh, state uh, re persistent, memcache is volatile, but we generally use memcache. Uh, what happens with memcache is we map all our cache tables into cache bins in memcache. So instead of a database request, like even when your page is cached in Drupal, you still have a database request going to the cache tables, which is nothing but a key value store. Your cache tables are a key value store. So you can have those key values stored in the memory, and memory look lookup will be a lot less expensive than your database lookup. So always use memcache, and you will find that all your page starts loading a lot faster. Opcache comes built in with PHP now. So just enable it, and you will see a significant difference, even if you do that in your local machine. Uh, database indexing, it is a separate subject in its own. Uh, it is one of the most complex part of optimizing a, an application. But it is also the most important part because uh, most of the time of a request on your server side is spent on the database. PHP only uh, takes 30% of the time, rest 60 to 70% of time is taken actually by the database, especially in Drupal. So if you have unindexed tables, it's going to create a lot of problems for you. Like you need to find out your views, what are the queries that you generally use in your views, enable slow query log in MySQL, and uh, try to find out the slow queries, and try to optimize or do indexing around those queries. And you will find a significant improvement in your application. Uh, there's a script called dbTuner available on d.o. Download that and try to uh, use that on your site, and it will give you a good insight of what is wrong with your database. So till now, we talked about anonymous user mostly. Authenticated user, optimizing uh, authenticated user is a big challenge. Till Drupal 7, it was not an easy task. How many of you think they have done a very good job in, op in optimizing for authenticated users? I don't think there's anyone, neither me. Uh, but there were certain things not really worked really well, but it was still there. and. Uh, there are a lot of examples which are, for example, BlazeMeter used to use OpCache. Uh, uh, what OpCache does is it, it has, it will try to cache the static part of your page. And the dynamic part of your page will be, uh, there will be token left on your 
page when it when the page request is sent and those tokens for your authenticated part of your page is replaced through a subsequent ajax request that's how our cache works correct me if i'm wrong okay <laughs> so that is how our cache works what it happens is when in your web page everything might not be dynamic there will be certain blocks which are dynamic there will be uh, the header section where you have hello admin has hello username there will be certain blocks and some part of some part here and there otherwise the page there will be another section of the page which is not dynamic so you can still load the page and serve the dynamic part later in an ajax request this worked pretty fine but it was still like you will notice that there will be a, there will be a page and there will be some static component there and after some time it used to change that was not a very uh, very nice user experience but still it it was doable uh, and you can and that's how people used to optimize authenticated user in drupal 7 at least uh, there's a smarter way of doing that auth cache also has an auth cache esi module do you know what is esi how many of you know what is esi it's side it's side include what auth cache esi will do is you don't have an ajax request now you have an esi and that esi component will be will be fetched for the dynamic part rather than an ajax request so it's a better way than this now this one more thing called big pipe which i will cover later and i'll show a small video on this this is something which is going to make uh, drupal 8 very interesting so we will see that later and this is this would be the way to optimize your drupal 8 application and it's pretty nice we'll talk about it sometime later back to navin to take you to some other things some are the big performance improvements in drupal 8 uh, we have we we have now ss system in core that will provide the lot of functionality out of the box so we don't need to take headache to manage the assets or css that whatever the at whatever the level they were get altered and so it was a big problem for the cdn uh, for the varnish at the varnish level that got cached the whole pages we have the entity cache how many of us know about the entity cache module in d7 yep uh, it's in the core its whole functionality is in the core and caching is enabled by default in the standard and the minimal profile and all the assets and the css uh, css aggregation and javascript javascript aggregation is enabled by default so how many of us know about the cache api in drupal 7 how many of you aware about cache get or set oh lot of us that was the cache api in drupal 7 <laughs> it's just a fancy name <laughs> you use it every day <laughs> so how many of you have faced issue with cache get cache cache set any one of you like cache clear all <laughs> i like it when i have to take a take a side down <laughs> and uh, there's something something which is very interesting uh, is if you enable devel module and look and enable queries on your page you will see the slowest query is the one which acts, uh, yeah which uh, which is to the cache table i don't know why it is very slow so there were problems with cache api in drupal 7 so the cache api in drupal 8 was not drupal 7 was not so robust but it in drupal 7 it's more robust than it was in drupal 7 it is designed like for handling for the not for the anonymous users but only for the authenticated users as well but the caching system for the anonymous system is same is as in the drupal 8 that was in drupal 7 so there is nothing more change with the for for the anonymous caching but it has been changed for the authenticated authenticated users so th <coughs> there are couple of things that caching cache api has so cache we have cache we have cache tags uh, cache context and cache message and for when invalidations uh, cache tags so it uh, whenever in drupal 7 
we if something is something sometimes we want to clear the cache we 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 directly do the cache clear all so that's not the right way it 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 was doing the clearing the cache for the whole of our site or our application so in drupal 8 we have cache tags here for adding the data dependencies for the uh, in the render uh, render arrays that that this particular this particular part is dependent on this particular entity or so so we have cache tags uh, cache tags with us for manage the dependence on the data or the configuration that we have suppose uh, uh, i have a module with a blog that is displaying the facebook like box so how so in drupal 7 what we need was we we just passed it constant there drupal no cache do we know drupal no cache constant yes so in drupal 7 it was also the same uh, that we, if we don't pass any any constant there by default it will add the max cache uh, max edge that we will discuss later that uh, if we want to explicitly not add adding any cache metadata with any of the things then we can use the cache max edge there so in Drupal 7, we don't have any anything render caching or fragment caching with us. We, what we were doing is we were fa we were saving our whole of our HTML page and we were saving it either in our cache tables or at CD or at varnish levels or at our CDNs. So ca cache cache can be varied by variations from from permissions to roles to urls to from from user roles to anything so for handling those for for handling those as well as for access checkers we have cache contacts here so we can we just need to add the cache contacts with our fragments or our renders render arrays that we have so we we will add the dependencies that uh, that this context, this this particular part is uh, needs this <coughs> will be varied by this variation or so, and the cache API will take care of that out of the box. So dynamic page cache is one of the module which is doing the same for same stuff for us. So cache max edge, as I was saying earlier, that uh, if we want. If you want that some render arrays to outdate explicitly uh, ourselves, that sometimes we explicitly want to clear the cache, like I already said, that cache clear all function that we all like. So, so we can add the cache permanent or cache null as well. So one more thing with the within the, within this cache API is that we have services. We with cache all the caches are services in Drupal 8. How many of you know about these services? Yeah. So we can replace out all of our cache system with any of the system we like. So don't do not do that cache backend null. So it will, <laughs> it will set the cache to null. So we have <coughs> BigPy. So that, that improvement, that idea came from the BigPy. So so for implementing the big pipe strategy, we the cache API got introduced and a lot of the improvements got included into this. So, so dynamic page cache was one of the major steps towards big pipe. So big pipe is rightly not in the core, but it will be. It already there is an issue introduced to introduce this module as an experimental in 8.1. Now Abhishek will proceed with the Thanks, uh, so uh, we will look at different kind of uh, caches that are present in Drupal 8. Like for example, there's something called page caching which is similar to what we have in Drupal 7. It has not changed, so it, it gives you caching for uh, anonymous pages, uh, pages and it works similarly to Drupal 7. Uh, we did some benchmarking. Uh, we used a tool called Apache Benchmark to benchmark and see how caching works for uh, anonymous user and uh, you can see there are 67 requests per second but 
when the user becomes authenticated, the number of the concurrency re reduces with the the page load time increases if we add more concurrency. So it's doing fairly well. Uh, there's one more uh, concept called dynamic page caching, which is new in Drupal 8. This was not in Drupal 7. Uh, earlier we talked about auth cache. Dynamic page caching is similar to that. So it is again enabled by default in Drupal 8. It has some cache metadata that it leaves on the pages when it is uh, being rendered. And then uh, that part is, uh, the dynamic part is later on, later on uh, filled later on with uh, Ajax request or ESI. So it is similar to auth cache that we do, where we talked about earlier. So benchmarking with dynamic page, page caching also gave us a uh, pretty good result. Uh, what is interesting is BigPipe, which uh, Naveen was mentioning earlier. It is generally for authenticated users. One thing that Big, BigPipe will not do is it will not increase your, uh, it will not decrease your page load time, by the way. So there's no, di inf uh, no difference in page load time you will see after including, after enabling BigPipe. So what is the advantage of using BigPipe? <laughs> So if the page loads in, if the document dot ready fires in three seconds, after including big, big pipe, it will still fire in three seconds. So why use big pipe? Yes, so there's something called perceived optimization. Uh, we will see a small video in which we can uh, see how the same page load, but the page looks really different. So, uh, so like yeah, like like we have in the slide during rendering, the personalized part are sent on later. There's something called flush and ob flush in, in PHP. How many of you know what is flush in PHP? So what flush does is it will clear the output buffer. Uh, the D8 architecture has changed a lot from D7. In D7, this was not possible. In D8, you can flush the output. So what D8, what Drupal does here is, it will generate only the static parts of the page in the building, and it will leave the dynamic part for later. Once the static part is generated, it will flush the output, and the output reach, reaches to the user. Now later on, uh, the when the dynamic part is calculated, when it's uh, rendered, it will, it will send it to the client again. This is how flush in PHP works. And uh, I personally tried to do, do OB flush in uh, Drupal 7, was not able to do it. If I could have done it, it would have been a great thing, but it was not possible in Drupal 7. And in Drupal 8, we have big pipe now. It's very interesting. Uh, like we did some benchmark and did not find any difference in Apache benchmark with big pipe, but Here's something which will tell you why is big pipe interesting. Sorry. So he, here we see a page with some dynamic content on the side. And then uh, there's a comment which is again uh, personalized content. So on the left side, we see traditional. On the right side, we see big pipe. Now we are seeing this for cold cache. Cold cache means uh, uh, the cache is not generated, the cache is not warm, and it is renting. So 6.5 minutes, the same time, but you saw the difference. Now when the cache is warm, both static and dynamic part loaded at the same time. The page load time is the same but you see a difference. But if you tell someone which page is loading fast, what would the person say? The left side or the right side? So this is called perceived optimization. Uh, yeah. Uh, there are some certain tools which you should be aware of if you want to do some performance optimization. For the front end side, the easiest way is Google PageSpeed. Uh, always refer the Google PageSpeed inside. And if you have a score less than 90, your website is 
not good. And if you have something less than 80, your website is bad. You seriously need to do something about it. Uh, Wiselow is another good tool. Uh, it will give you a lot of recommendations, both of these tools. And all you need to do is just follow those recommendations. Another very important part is, uh, I have seen this happening very uh, a lot in India than in other places. What happens is designers give you images and those images are very high quality images. And the developers, they will just put the same image in the server. Drupal will, yes, optimize it. Uh, Drupal will make certain changes, uh, but it will not, it will still not optimize it as much as you want it to. So it is always a good idea to optimize your images. Uh, like if there are some designers in this room, is there any designer in this room? No. Okay. So if you meet a designer, you ask him to always save for web. Never do a save in Photoshop. If you are creating images in Photoshop, always do a save for web. What it does is it optimizes it. For the web, it removes all the metadata, which is not required. And the, the images are optimized. There are some tools uh, available. I have not mentioned it. I'll probably mention it later. There are some tools, which uh, some script which I found, which will opti just optimize all your images in your site's default files directory. Once I ran that tool, and my website suddenly became very fast. Um, Apache Benchmark is a good tool for stress testing, but do not consider Apache Benchmark results as the exact speed in which the site will be rendered to your to your uh, uh, users, because. With Apache Benchmark, if you're doing it locally, it is, it is just testing the latency of the server. It is not testing the network or the browser rendering. And uh, so it's a very inaccurate tool for that. And you need to understand that it is not meant for that. What you need to, what you, what you can do with Apache Benchmark is you can stress test your server. You can see how much stress concurrent users it can handle, right? Uh, and, and that is different from what a particular user, how fast the web page is for a particular user. So if you want to stress test your server, it is a good tool. If you want to stress test your server, JMeter is a bad tool, by the way. Now why is JMeter a bad tool for stress testing your server? Now JMeter is a good tool for stress testing your server if JMeter is installed on the same server. But if, you are, if I'm in my local machine, I have a JMeter installed and I'm and I'm uh, trying to stress test a server on Acquia Cloud, it's a bad idea. Because my network bandwidth will exhaust a lot before the server will reach its limit, right? So how do we solve that problem? It's something called Blaze Meter. It is, Blaze Meter is an enterprise version of JMeter. It's, J, it's JMeter on cloud. So what it will do is it will do JMeter tests to your server from different geographical locations on the across the world with a high bandwidth uh, connection. So you will never reach that stress and you can do stress testing of your server. So if you want to really stress test your server, you might want to check out what Blaze Meter is. And their website is made in Drupal, by the way. I think that's the end of the session. If you have any questions, please ask. Was it that bad? <laughs> it's not a part of core yet. It's a separate module. It will be part of core in 8.1x. Uh, probably, not even, I'm not sure. Probably it will be part very soon. There is already a proposal for that, but it's up to the core, core maintenance. But there is a contributed module which you can use. It will give you, and uh, you will not notice a lot of difference in a page which is uh, slightly dynamic. If you have a highly dynamic page, like if I had a page like my Facebook wall, big pipe will make a huge difference. But if you have a default Drupal's uh, installation page, uh, like home page, you won't notice much difference with big pipe. Yes. Uh, I have a two questions. Uh, like you have mentioned that uh, there is a views query we have to optimize. So how can we identify that this view is a, a, a firing a slow query? So yeah, so in MySQL, if you go to my.cnf, there will be a configuration where you enable slow query log. And you specify the path of the slow query. Yeah, 
Yeah, uh, if you are too lazy like me, then you can use the web profiler module. And how, how can I uh, optimize that query? Uh, look at the query and uh, try to find uh, bad joins. Try to remove bad joins. And uh, if you really can't remove any joins, try to index your database uh, with the fields that you are in the where clause, you will find some fields that you are accessing. Try to include those where cl where fields in your where clause in the index of the table. <laughs> or Jeff could answer that. Have you, have you heard of uh, the explain? Yes. So explain will tell you a lot about like each field, mm -hmm. the joins, and things like that. It doesn't tell you what how to fix it, but it tells you where to start looking. Thanks. Yes. So Apache, uh, Apache Benchmark is a very small tool which is shipped with your, uh, your Apache, default Apache. And it's very small. It's like, it's not even full-fledged uh, stress testing tool. It's just, you just give Apache Benchmark some parameters and it will make a uh, network connection to the website. Very simple, uh, command line tool for easily doing some kind of small stress testing or see how fast the site is loading. Uh, JMeter is more full-fledged uh, uh, sorry, stress testing tool and uh, it's a Java-based application which you run. It, it gives you a lot of, uh, lot of things that you can, like for example, in, J in JMeter you can, uh, you can mimic how a authenticated user will be on the, for example, I can, uh, you will find a lot of JMeter scripts called JMX on GitHub which will be meant for Drupal, which will be meant to stress test uh, Drupal's, uh, for example, authentication or creating a node, creating a user, all these things. You can write uh, steps for, uh, create, uh, for creating a user and you can run, replay those steps using JMeter and it will, it will exactly mimic how user will do it and with a stress of 500 users, 1000 users. Also, you can ramp up in JMeter, like you start with one user and ramp up slowly and then come down. Uh, Apache Benchmark will just burst all the requests. Like if you have congruency of 10, 10 it will burst. It, it cannot ramp up or ramp down. Blaze Meter is just JMeter hosted on cloud. Like for example, I cannot use my local machine, JMeter on my local machine to uh, stress test an Acquia cloud environment server on Aqua Cloud environment. Because uh, Aqua Cloud uh, will have a high network bandwidth and uh, it has more computation capability than my systems and uh, the bandwidth that my system has. So if, for example, my bandwidth would be 10 Mbps. So the maximum amount of stress which I can, I can give to the server is 10 Mbps, right? But that is like nothing for a server hosted in any cloud environment. So that is a bad way to stress test that. So how do you use JMeter to stress test uh, a live server? You can use BlazeMeter. BlazeMeter is just an enterprise version of JMeter. And what BlazeMeter does is it has several several uh, locations, ge geographical locations, just like any other CDN works. It has geographical location where they have BlazeMeter installed. You can choose different geographical locations and from there, it will have a high bandwidth uh, stress on your server. And the bandwidth not, will not get choked. So that's what it is. Thank you. Any more questions? Yes, please. I did not follow that very much. Can you explain? Or someone? Okay. So there is one site, and I am scheduling one of the content to be uh, published after six hours. Okay. And if I set up a cache max slide, then it won't show up uh, after the six hours, right? Okay. So I how see. do we? Sorry. I think I understand your question. Okay. So I think she's talking about the. There are two settings. 
the hash max lifetime, like and and hash run for like but expiration. Yes, I think uh, the one uh, she's talking about is the minimum cache lifetime. Yes. And if you set that, what happens is your cache will not expire before that time. So if you are scheduling a content to be published uh, in that amount of time, it will not happen because still that time, your cache will not be updated. So only after your cache is updated, even if you run cron, uh, your scheduler will run and the, it will be published in the back end. But, uh, but your cache, it is not available in your cache because you have set minimum cache lifetime. So uh, the ideal thing is never set minimum cache lifetime to so high. I think what, and what you're asking is, is, I think what you're asking is, Aquia's insight will tell you that you've set a bad setting. Ignore that. That's bad advice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one more thing I want to add. That what they could actually do is actually clear front, clear cache. What you could probably also do uh, is clear caches irreversibly for the missing pages. Do the cron itself, like when you uh, run it, just click on the runs the computer and also run your home page cache here, such that those newly published nodes do pop up on the home page when uh, in this system, right? But you don't want to uh, set the Selectively for uh, clearing the cache of the site as part of the same front that runs the scheduler might do the trick. We should have, a, mm -hmm. we should have like a, a debate a panel debate about minimum cache lifetime. Yes, that's very debatable. <laughs> All right. Any more questions? But uh, I want to add something here that. Uh, there was an issue that got committed in 8.1.x that on running the cron, the cache will not get cleared. <laughs> See, cron is not just a Drupal cron. If you want to say cron, you could have your own just in your own cron. Yeah. So, through this, uh, through one custom cron, she's actually uh, scheduling some, I mean, running the scheduler, which is publishing some nodes. And I would probably add clearing the cron of my, uh, clearing the cache of my home page or the whole site. Or there is one more option that you can do, but uh, do not do this if you have a lot of content which is being created very often. Is whenever there is a content which is published through scheduler, you can use rules and you can clear the cache through it. Whenever the, a content, uh, for example, you are, are you using work, Workbench moderation? Okay, just okay, scheduler. So you can use rules and you can find out whenever content is published just clear the home page cache so that is one other way to do it Yep, invalidations will automatically take care of that. That service is, uh, if you want to ex extend that service and want to take care of any, want to do something other stuff or do clearing of other thing, then you can do that as well. But service decorated is the best option instead of extending that service. Yep. Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, let me rephrase what you said. You said that when we are using CDNs, we make extra call to a third party site which is a CDN, right? We do not make an extra call. The CDN sits in front of your site. And what it will do is, it will take care of most of the requests. When you're considering a request, when you uh, request a simple, simple page, google.com, do you know how many requests does it make? It will make more than 100 requests. 
one will be the request of the document and then there will be JavaScript, CSS, images, and whatnot. So there are at least 100 HTTP requests which is fired by one simple uh, request that you make. So what CDN will do, it will take care of uh, all the static requests. It will make a static cache of all these things. So your server can do what it's meant to do. What your server is meant to serve uh, con uh, HTML pages, right, through Drupal. Drupal at the end generates an HTML page, right? Other things are static requ request which has nothing to do with Drupal unless you have private files. So this CDN will sit in front of your application and will take care of everything, including attacks like DDoS, DOS attacks, or security attacks, right? And it's not an extra call. It's, it's just uh, something in between, and it's just, it just proxies the legitimate request to our server. That's it. You will do the same thing if you have a reverse proxy. For example, if I have Warnish, it does the same thing. It proxies, uh, proxies the request to Apache whenever it cannot find a cache. So CDN pretty much does the same thing. CDN can be as invisible and can be rendered through the regular www domain, which uh, uh, renders the rest so yeah. of the site. So yeah, if you are asking <coughs> that, I said that adding an extra domain is bad. At the same time, you should add, you, you should serve your static content from extra domain. For example, you have seen a lot of site using cdn.sitename.com, right? That is because you do not want to serve your static resources from the same domain where you are serving your dynamic requests, because that has cookies. So you create another CDN dot your domain dot com, so that and that trade off is not too bad. You are just adding one more domain lookup, and it's not even a domain lookup because you are just subdomaining it. So it's not even another domain lookup, but you are saving a lot of extra headers in terms of cookies. That's why we have the CDN dot site, site name dot com and stuff like that. Can we catch the REST APIs in Drupal? Can we cache REST, REST, REST APIs? Can yes, you? why not? How exactly? I mean, not aware of it. So REST API, like if you are talking. Services model. OK. Yeah. So it has, what it does is on the view layer, everything. Yes. What you need, to, what you're generating as HTML, you're just uh, generating it as a JSON, right? The view layer only changes. Everything else beyond that remains the same. Right. And your caching happens there. Okay. It's not page caching. Yeah. If okay. you're talking about page caching, it is different from that. Okay. But your caching happens before the final render. Only the render changes, right? Okay. In Drupal, everything ultimately goes to a render function, which renders it either through a TPL or through, uh, G through JSON, right? Only that changes. Be be below that, everything is the same. Okay. So it, ca it is handled by uh, Drupal catch and the map catch? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. And your REST API could also sit behind the CDN. Okay. So that, like, if it was an anonymous REST request, it's just an HTTP request. Yes. And it could get cached. Right. So long as you're not also passing like a session yeah. uh, ID or a parameter. Or not. Any more questions? Oh, I forgot to mention this. Neuralic is a beautiful tool. Uh, if you are doing a performance optimization, uh, you should always use Neuralic. Period. You should always use it. Uh, it has very good insight. Uh, but I think we are uh, Neuralic and HX, XHProf. These are very good tools for uh, not only performance optimizing, but for, for performance solving. For example, uh, Neuralic will tell you exactly on what layer is uh, your application is spending how much time? How much time is going into a database? How much time is PHP consuming? And uh, what is the slowest function? 
and what is the slowest query, everything, everything is, you, you get a variety of information with Neuralink. And Neuralink also has a Drupal agent, yeah. which will uh, give you a lot of information about, about Drupal. PHP agent, Java agent, and it has a Drupal agent. So Neuralink is, is one of the finest tools that I have come across, and you should, you should try using it. If you are doing some serious business with your website, I think you definitely need to have Neuralink installed on your system. Thank you, Daniel, for this. Any more questions? So one thing I uh, want to add with the big pipe that uh, I told you that there are a couple of three modules that page cache, internal page cache, dynamic page cache, and big pipe, big pipe uh, with Drupal to for the for rendering out the data. So uh, we don't have any UI associated with it. Why don't have why don't we have any UI associated with it? Any guesses? This is a developer UI. Yeah. So if you if you will uh, provide a UI for that, then we have another dependency of Config Factory for it. So there was a issue for that. So I have uh, I am working on a sandbox project. Uh, could you open that link? That big pipe all. Automatically take care of cheap part of the page and automatically send it first. But if you are interested in, uh, if you are, if you really need a UI for that for altering it, I am working with, I am working with Bimliers on it. If you are interested, feel free to join. Feel free to contribute. Uh, I would love, I would love to add more contributors to it. What do you expect to see on the UI? Yeah, uh, big pipe on. Big pipe, uh, we don't have any UI to for, for particular pages that to alter what stuff to come serve first. So that stuff would be taken care of there. So this thing we can add in the core, and we will we definitely not recommend anyone to do to use it on the production. But in the development, it's it would be a great tool. And please remember, we are hiring. So anyone who is interested can come and speak to me or come to our booth. Thank you.